lesson is from the New Testament, from 1 John chapter 4. It's God's great love for us in Jesus that leads us to love one another. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God that hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. This is God's word. The place where Jesus gave that command to love one another is our gospel lesson. From John chapter 15. Please stand. We hear Jesus' words in our gospel lesson. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my Father's, in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. May be seated. Go ahead and sing a song about God's love for us, how deep the Father's love for us during. The last person, children are here. I had to come up to the children for the children's devotion. Oh, 
nice to have you fill out the whole step in the front. I want you to think about how much Jesus loves you. If you were with your arms to show me how much Jesus loves you, what would you do? How much does Jesus love you? <laughs> Can you do something with your arms? <laughs> like, does Jesus love you like this much? No. How much does he love you? Like this much? More? Like this much? Jesus loves you this much? Can you do that with your arms? Put your arms out like this. <laughs> Jesus loves me this much. There you can do it. That's great. Do you agree? This is how much Jesus loves you, right? Like this much. Right? Now I want you to turn and look at the people next to you. Like actually look at them. No, look at the other way. Look the other way. Look at the first one that is left. Do you know how much Jesus wants you to love those people? The same amount. If Jesus loves us this much, Jesus today tells us that we should love each other. How much? Can you do it with your arms? <laughs> like this much, that's how much we should love each other. Like this much now. Do we always do that? Do we always love each other this much? You know, sometimes we're mean to each other or we're not kind to each other. And that's called a sin, right? Sometimes we sin against God by not loving. And when we sin, who do we need to take our sins to? Jesus, because what does Jesus do with all of our sins? He takes them all the way and he loves us. How much does he love us? Like this much, right? And Jesus' love for us leads us to look at the people around us and to love them this much too. So the more that we hear about Jesus, the more we know about Jesus' love, that's what leads us to the people around us, whether it's our brothers or sisters or friends or classmates, it leads us to love them just like Jesus loves us. We say a prayer about that? Let's hold your hands and bow your head. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for forgiving all of our sins. Help us to love the people around us that much too, whether it's our brothers or sisters or friends or classmates. Help us to love other people like you love us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up here. God bless you all.
God wanted to prove his power over death to us. He wanted to prove that there's hope after death for his people. And so do you know how many people in the Bible were raised from the dead? It kind of depends on how you count. But for us today, we're going to say seven. Seven people. In the Old Testament, the two great prophets, Elijah and Elisha, each raised to life a little boy. In the New Testament, two of the apostles, Peter, he raised to life the woman we just heard about in our lesson. And then Paul raised to life a man who fell asleep and died during one of his sermons. That's, that's what really happened. That's four people. Then Jesus himself raised three people from the dead. He raised the son of a widow at the town called Nain. He raised the daughter of Jairus. And he raised his own friend Lazarus back to life. And we go through the Bible, the number of people raised from the dead is seven. I said it kind of depends on how you count. There's actually more. In the Old Testament, there's a man who was raised to life because his, his dead body touched the dead bones of Elisha. And the moment his dead body touched Elisha's bones, he popped back up to life. Or on Good Friday, when Jesus died, we're told that tombs in Jerusalem broke open and believers in God were raised back to life. And of course, we haven't mentioned the greatest resurrection of all, which was Jesus. He raised himself back to life. And so, it depends on how you count it. But for us today, if you just think of the specific people whom God raised from the dead, in the Bible we hear about some. Now what if you had been given the responsibility to decide which seven people to raise back to life? You think in the whole history of the world, there have been billions and billions of people who have lived on earth. What if it was up to you or to me to decide which seven of the billions of people in the history of the world should be raised back to life and live a little bit longer on earth? That'd be a big responsibility, wouldn't it? I think we'd sit down and we'd think of who are the most important, the most influential people that should be raised to life to live a little longer on earth. Maybe like kings of, of ancient times or famous inventors or maybe great leaders or really talented people. Who would be the, the seven most important people that we could raise to life to live a little bit longer on earth? And who would you choose? Of, of the seven people who were raised back to life in the Bible, how many of them were kings? How many of them were brilliant scientists? How many of them were prophets? Zero. How many of them were basketball players? Zero. It's surprising, isn't it? It's not what we would expect. Instead, those seven people are Three little boys, one little girl, Jesus' friend, an old lady, and a man who fell asleep during a sermon and died. <laughs> Those were the seven people that God chose out of all the millions of people in the world to raise back to life. And do you think God wants to teach us something about who really is important? In our lesson today, we, we hear about a, a woman. We're told that in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. The city of Joppa is a port city on the Mediterranean Sea. It's about 38 miles from Jerusalem. It's well known in the Bible because Joppa is the place that the prophet Jonah set sail from when he was trying not to go to Nineveh, where God wanted to go. Remember that story? I get swallowed by the fish. He leaves from the port of Joppa. And in Joppa, there was a Christian woman who had a name that just unfortunately doesn't sound that great in English. Dorcas. In Greek, the name Dorcas actually means gazelle. It was a beautiful name for a girl or for a woman. Gazelle, it just doesn't sound that way in English. Dorcas. So we're not going to use that one. We're going to use her other name, Tabitha. And what's surprising is we don't hear anything about Tabitha's family. You know how important family was in the Bible. We don't hear about Tabitha's parents. And so we assume they're probably dead. 
We don't hear about Tabitha having a husband, so either she never married or she was a widow. We don't hear about Tabitha's children, and so we assume she didn't have any children at all. It's just her. It was just Tabitha. And I wonder if sometimes she felt that way. That it was just Tabitha. And she was kind of a nobody. And she had nothing. Just Tabitha. At least I think that's what we would have thought about her. Just a nobody. You know, like when we're constantly evaluating other people, in our minds, whether we want to admit it or not, we're constantly evaluating how important other people are. Is this person worth my time? Is this person worth saying hi to? And sadly, what do we often decide? No! Because most people just aren't that important, right? It sounds awful to say it, doesn't it? But I think it's true. As you look around at the world, most people just aren't that important. It's really easy to neglect the people who don't seem like they're very important. I bet I know who you look down on the most. I bet I know the person you call a nobody more than anybody else. Can I guess who it is? It's you. Am I right? I bet the person in your life that you talk the worst about is you. I bet the person that you call a nobody or nothing or not important more than anybody else, I bet that person is, is you. The Bible tells us to love other people like we love ourselves, and that can kind of be a problem. Because sometimes we treat other people like nobodies because that's what we think we are. Nobodies. Sometimes we treat other people like they're not important because honestly, when we look at ourselves, we don't think that we're not important either. Do you ever feel like a nobody? Then God wants you to realize something today. God wants you to realize that Jesus cares deeply for even the seemingly unimportant people. Out of the billions of people who lived in the history of the world, Jesus only raised seven of them back to life, and who was included among those seven people? Tabitha. This single lady who had no family. Why would God have chosen to raise her to life? Because she mattered. She mattered to, to God. We're told that Tabitha got sick and died. When the Christians heard that Peter, his disciple, was in a nearby town, they sent two men to him and urged him, saying, please come to us. And so Peter went with them. These are just simple details, but I hope you realize they're saying something amazing. When this, this woman named Tabitha died, Peter dropped everything to come. Because Tabitha mattered to God. So this is what God wants us to see today. That Jesus cares deeply even about the seemingly most unimportant people. Like you and me. Talked about how we consider ourselves often as nobodies. We're not important. We don't do anything right. And on top of all that, we know the sins that we've done wrong. And I mean, Jesus, he came to earth for us. He died on the cross to forgive our sins. He rose from the dead to give us eternal life and I want you to know that you matter to Jesus. Jesus cares deeply about even the seemingly most unimportant people. And maybe you say to yourself, well, I can't do anything right. And you know, sometimes that's true. You and I fail in all sorts of different ways. But God doesn't love you because of what you do right. You realize that, right? God doesn't love you because of how you look. You realize that too, right? God loves you by grace. God loves you all because of His undeserved love for you. God wants you to see this in His Word today. You matter to God. Just like Tabitha did. You're important to Jesus. Jesus dearly loves even seemingly unimportant people. And so when, when Tabitha died, Peter dropped everything and he went. When he got to 
Joppa, they took him to this upstairs room where Tabitha had been laid. There in the upstairs room, all the widows gathered around Peter, and they were crying, and they were showing him robes and clothes that Tabitha had made while she was still with them. It seems like Peter didn't know Tabitha personally, but the moment he showed up, people told Peter what Tabitha was like. And what did Tabitha spend lots and lots of time doing? <coughs> sewing. She spent her time sewing robes and clothes for widows and poor people. And isn't there a part of us that says, that's it? All this hubbub just about a lady who sewed some stuff? Does that really matter? I mean, doesn't it seem like if somebody wanted to, to give glory to God, they've got to do some glorious thing, right? You know, see, we're talking about our problem today. Our problem isn't just that we look down on unimportant people. We also look down on unimportant things. If somebody's going to give glory to God, they better do something big and glorious, right? Like save people's lives, or invent cool stuff, or win championships, or rule over people. Just, just so close. Or widows. How did that make it in the Bible? If someone's going to do something to God's glory, it's got to be something big and glorious, right? Yes. Except, you know what Jesus considered big and glorious? So in close for widows and poor people. You see, as Tabitha was sowing those clothes, she wasn't really sowing them for widows and for the poor. She was sowing them for Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that whatever we do in Jesus' name, we're actually doing for Jesus. And there's so much we can learn from this woman. It seems like maybe Tabitha just had one talent. So on. But look at how much she did with it. Instead of feeling sorry for herself, she saw this great opportunity that God gave her to serve God and to serve others. And and she ran with it. You see, the same Jesus who cares deeply about seemingly unimportant people, that same Jesus also loves to see the, the seemingly unimportant things that Christians do in his name. I studied the story. I thought about something that happens here in our church. You think about it, think about it? Pins and beans. We have a sewing group at our church. They call themselves pins and needles. And twice a month, a group of not quite young ladies get together <laughs> and they talk a lot. And they drink coffee. And then they sew some quilts. And they give them away. They give quilts to newborn babies and to patients in hospitals. They just give them away. Sometimes to, to widows in nursing homes who need them. You sit back and you think, does, does that really matter? And what's the answer? Yes. Absolutely. And in Jesus' eyes, there is nothing more beautiful that could be done. Jesus loves to see even the, the simplest, smallest things that Christians do in his name. So if you don't come to get the needles, then here's God's question to you today. What's, what's your pins and needles. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself, instead of thinking about all the things that you can't do, what opportunities does God give you to serve God by serving other people? What's your pins and needles? What seemingly unimportant things can you do for seemingly unimportant people all to the glory of God? I read that in the 300s, there was a famous pastor, one long ago named Chrysostom. And he actually preached about this same story, about Tabitha. And he told people, if you want to be remembered, then imitate Tabitha. Not pouring great expense in the lifeless matters, but pouring out yourself generously for your fellow human beings. I thought that was a really wise thing. Did you catch what he was saying? If you really want to be remembered as a Christian who followed Jesus, don't pour all your, your money into lifeless matters. Instead, pour yourself generously 
and to your fellow human beings. It's a good prayer that we can pray, God, just open up my eyes. Let me sit for Tabitha to see the ways I can serve you to serving others. What's, what's your pins and needles? But just in case we think that this story is all about Tabitha, there's one more thing we have to know. Do you know what the greatest thing that Tabitha did was? It wasn't actually her sewing. Do you know what thing Tabitha did that caused the greatest good for other people? She died. Sounds kind of upside down, doesn't it? But actually the greatest thing that Tabitha did that helped other people was that Tabitha died. This is often the way that our God works. Our God likes to take our moments of greatest weakness to show His glory and grace so that it's all done to the glory of God because the hero of this story and every story really was in Tabitha. But who's the hero of the story? It's God. It's not really about the things that Tabitha was doing. What the story is about is what God did for Tabitha. When Peter got there, he sent everybody out of the room. He got down on his knees and prayed. And he turned to this dead woman and he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. And so he took her by the hand and brought her to her feet. And then he brought her to the other Christians, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. And you think of all the things that Tabitha did, all the things that happened to her, the thing that brought the greatest good to other people was the fact that Tabitha died. God brought her back to life. Think, isn't that sometimes the way God works in our lives too? Sometimes in life you think that you're just finally figuring things out. You just finally get your life in rhythm. You're just finally on a roll. And then you get sick. And then you get hurt. And then maybe even people who you love them. And you say, why is this? And it's because God has this habit. He has a habit of in our weakest, most powerless moments, showing us most clearly His glory and His grace. At the end of our story, we're told that news about this spread throughout all of Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. It wasn't actually Tabitha sowing that got people to believe in Jesus. It was the fact that God allowed her to suffer and die and then raise her back to life and God's miraculous power over death that led many people to believe in the Lord. And it's kind of like how God allowed Jesus to suffer and die and through that to take all of our sins away and give us eternal life in heaven. Do you see how that works? Kind of like how in your life right now God is allowing you to go through hardships so that you learn to trust in God so that you learn to put your hope in the God who raises the dead, so that through your faith, even in the most difficult times, more people can learn about Jesus and be saved. See how God works. If you and I were meant to make a list of most important people in the history of the world who should be raised back to life, the Bible says, a single lady with no family. And we say, really? And Jesus says, absolutely, there is no one more important. We're going to make a list of really great, glorious things that give glory to God. And the Bible says, so in close. And we say, really? And Jesus would say, absolutely, there is nothing more beautiful that's ever done in my name. We're going to make a list of Great things that God does to carry out His will. The Bible says, let people die. And we say, really? And Jesus says, absolutely. So that God can raise them back to life again. I want you to know today that you matter to Jesus. Just look at Tabitha. I want you to know more than that. Your, your life, your life right now matters to Jesus. Look at Tabitha. So what's your pins and needles? Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, it's easy for us in our lives to feel like we're nobodies. 
If that were nothing, if that were nothing important. It's easy for us to think that we don't do any of the big glorious things that real Christians would do to give glory to you. And that's why you put stories like this one about Tabitha in the Bible. You show us through Tabitha that you care deeply, even for people who seem to be unimportant in the world's eyes. You show us that you love even the, the simplest things that your people do in your name. Even more, you show us that you're able to use things like sickness and death to carry out your will and bring more people to believe in Jesus. Dear Lord, we ask that today, use the story to convince us that we matter to you. Use the story to convince us that our lives and the things we do matter to you. Use the story to convince us that no matter what hardship we're facing today, you're behind it and you're working it out in your perfect plan to your glory. Dear Lord, just like you used Tabitha and her talent to sing, help us each to find a way that we can use our talents to your glory and to the service of others. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue by confessing our faith in God with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand to confess our faith to God. <laughs> We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he came fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thanks, Amen. We're blessed today at our church to welcome two new members into our congregation. So I invite Wayne and Joyce to come on up here to the front. Wayne and Joyce have been members of the Wisconsin State Church for a long time in Minnesota. And just recently they moved here to Oklahoma. And so they're transferring into our congregation. We're glad that you, we can welcome you today. The members of the Christ the King Lutheran Church, Wayne and Joyce Schlicker, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desire to become members of our congregation. Your brother and sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before His Father in heaven those who faithfully confess Him on earth. You become, come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned it, is faithful and true to the Word of God? And you so answer, I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, <coughs> and live a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do. Will you support with your time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation 
If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, I ask God to help me. Have you heard your promises? We, the members of Christ the King Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, I invite you to share in our worship and mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith and mercy, you have joined this brother and sister in Christ to your church when they were born again of water and spirit and baptism. In mercy, you have taught them your saving truth. Grant that they may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so they will not conform, conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's a blessing to have you at our church. Wayne and Joyce, welcome to Christ the King. Let's welcome them. As we welcome them, it's somebody's last day with us, at least for a while. Jonah's year of school at OSU is finishing up, and he's leaving us after today. For the summer, he will be back in August for about one more semester, right? And so we wish Jonah God's blessings on the summer. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> what this means is that over the summer all of you need to sing louder. <laughs> but not just louder, I mean better. Louder and better. And sure, it's just showing we're really blessed to have you here and we're thankful that you joined us. If you look out the window today, you can see that our playground is, is finished. And if it weren't such lousy weather, the kids could even play out there after church is over. And so we're thankful that the work on the playground itself is all done and it's all ready and open to having children play. You go out there, you notice there's two big, big things that need to happen yet. One is we need to still have our concrete port, our concrete um, patio area, picnic area. So if you're ever out there over the government, please don't don't go in the swimming pool that's out there. It's not, not very much to be a swimming pool. And then the one complication with the project is that they did hit the electrical line that goes from our church out to our shed. And Certainly could have been worse than one was hurt, but there's also a big hole. Just you'll see it out there, a big size hole. Don't fall in that hole. And it needs to stay open until our electrical line is fixed. And so with those two things remaining, the playground is all complete and it's ready for, for kids to use. So we're thankful for the donations that continue to come in that have made that playground possible. There are a lot of people to keep in our prayers today. So we go to our God with our prayer in the church. Heavenly Father, we were reminded in our sermon today that you care about all people, even those of us who seem to not be important. It's trusting in your grace and love to us and all people that we place a number of people in your care today. We pray for our, our brother Jonah as he travels back to his home for the summer. We're thankful for the blessing that Jonah's been to our church. We're thankful for the faith in you you put in his heart that the willingness to, to drive here each Sunday for Bible study and worship. And that you bless him over the summer and bring him back to us again in the fall. We're thankful, Lord, that you provided healthy baby boys to two families connected to our church. We praise you for Rowan Jacob Walker, who was born to our members Colin and Casey Walker this past week. Thank you for watching over both Casey and Rowan during pregnancy and birth. Family plans to have Rowan baptized this coming Saturday. We're thankful that he can become your child through baptism. Keep him and his family in your care. We're also thankful that you've given a healthy baby grandson to our members, John and Holly Douglas. Thankful that you watched over baby Isaac and his mother during pregnancy and birth. Pray that you also be with this family with your grace and care. As that you bless Tyler Sharp. Tyler is the daughter of Melanie and Danny Roberts. Tyler's had two surgeries over the past week. 
Lord, we're thankful that these procedures could be done, and we pray that as Tyler recovers, that you give her health and strength. We pray that no further uh, treatment is needed, uh, but that you guide her and her family. We pray for a co-worker of Denise Reed, who's been diagnosed with a tumor on his brain stem. Lord, this must be shocking news for this man and his family. We ask that you keep him in your care, that you guide the doctors who are coming up with a treatment plan for him. If it's your will, and you, you take this tumor away and allow him to remain here on earth with us. Bless his family in this difficult time. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. We taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Bless today to have the Lord's Supper, which we receive Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. One of the things the Bible says about the Lord's Supper is that it's a powerful way to show Christians that they're totally united on God's teaching from the Bible. That's why we ask that people be members of our church or another church in our Wisconsin Synod before they take communion with us. And so for visitors today, I'd love the chance to, to teach you our faith builders class before you come up and, and join us for the Lord's Supper. Continue on page 12 in your worship folder. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
May God today with God's blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Sing our closing song. Oh, how good it is.